Or then there's postmodernism. What is the definition of modernism and postmodernism? And why do we find these two so confusing? Newton's Principia is a rape manual. I have to say there's a lot of postmodern work I just don't understand, so I can't comment on it. As Lyotard put it in his work defining the postmodern, a work can become modern only if it is first postmodern. Postmodernism thus understood is not modernism at its end. But in its nascent nature, this state is constant. Are you confused as well? I don't blame you, but that's the whole point of this. It seems to me uh, some exercise by intellectuals who were talking to each other in very obscure ways, and I can't follow it, and I don't know if anybody else can. The postmodernists came onto the scene, and they were all Marxists. And now look, the postmodernists were Marxists, so let's make no mistake about that. No, the bloody postmodernists don't believe in biology. You don't have to engage in civilized debate. You don't have to give a damn about the facts, especially if you're not a postmodernist, because you don't believe in facts anyways. And you might ask, well, why don't you? Hey, I'm not kidding. I'm not kidding. Postmodernists don't believe in facts. Leotard makes the argument that the advanced societies, he means developed societies, after World War II, we can call them post-industrial societies, no longer possess or require what he called meta-narratives of legitimation, like, like Marxism, Marxism. And they were all Marxists. Or a Hegelian notion of an integrated moral state or progress. These post-industrial societies are post-modern. Post-modern. It's just not true. I mean, to the extent you can understand it. I mean, on the other hand, there is a point. I mean, insofar as they say that uh, everything that people do is some kind of social construction, depends on the, the, the historic context, cultural context, you know, that part's true. And I, I think it's fundamentally wrong in, in many ways. I mean, it, it's right. Um, and yet it seems absolutely true and absolutely appropriate. And there was this. I know I'm taking a long time to answer your question. There was this way in which I all of a sudden realized that the point of being postmodern or being avant-garde or whatever wasn't to follow in a certain kind of tradition, that all that stuff is BS imposed by critics and camp followers afterwards, that what the really great artists do, and it sounds very trite to say it out loud, well, what the really great artists do is they're entirely themselves. They're entirely themselves, they've got their own vision, their own way of fracturing reality, and that if it's authentic and true, you will feel it in your nerve endings. And this is what Blue Velvet did for me. I'm not suggesting it would do it for any other viewer. So what's up with these people? These deconstructionists, these postmodernists, what are they up to exactly? They saw danger in what Leotard called the meta-narrative, and actually embraced local narratives and the diversity of them. The basic narrative of human struggle is oppressor versus oppressed. Because the basic narrative is oppressor versus oppressed, we choose those narratives that serve our function as oppressors. So, what does postmodern mean in uh, literature? No, 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 no. It's the <laughs> after modernism. Is okay. What it, means. But, <laughs> yeah, what it means. Or they are the enemy of any they are the enemy of anyone who holds the tenets of individuality dear. I um it's a very useful catch-all term because you say it and we all nod soberly as if we as know we what we're talking about. In fact, we don't. Know. There are certain, when I mean postmodern, I'm talking about um, maybe the black humorists who came along in the 1960s, the post-Nabokovians. I'm talking about Pynchon and Bartholomew and yeah. Barth, uh, DeLillo in the early 70s, Coover, um, and I'm sure I'm leaving out a lot. Um, uh, um, let me see. Um, but that's the camp you put yourself in. With, I think, that, comparison, I think, that's, that's, the, I think that's the camp that interested me when I was a student. The problem is I think postmodernism has to a large extent run its course. It's, came, it's come to dominate all of the humanities, which are, which are dead as far as I can tell, and a huge proportion of the social scientists, sciences. And we've been publicly funding extremely radical postmodern leftist thinkers who are hell-bent on demolishing the fundamental substructure of Western civilization. And that's no... That's no paranoid delusion. Well, it seems to me that's my Michel Foucault in the middle and a more reprehensible individual you could hardly ever discover or even dream up, no matter how twisted your imagination. Bon, est-ce que j'ai du temps pour répondre? Oui, Combien? Parce que... Deux minutes. Ben, moi, je dirais que c'est injuste. Absolutely. 
Non, mais euh, bon, je ne veux pas répondre dans un, un si peu de temps. Je dirais simplement ceci. Je ne peux pas m'empêcher, contrairement à ce que vous... The, the ways in which philosophy has been uh, uh, taken over and improperly applied like this, the so-called, the whole issues of the so-called science wars with the postmodernism. Yeah. Is, is, I wonder what, if you have a, your thoughts oh, about I, that. I think there are two different wars going on. There's the... They're the so-called postmodernists in the literature departments versus the analytic philosophers in the philosophy departments. And that war, if you like, is just the philosophy department's fault. They refused to teach Nietzsche, Hegel, Heidegger, mm. Derrida, those people. Well, somebody was going to teach them, so the literature people began teaching right. them. I mean, you know, it, it just, there was a vacuum waiting to be filled. Uh, the science wars, I think, are different. Uh, the scientists got accustomed to being told that they were sort of a new priesthood. They were the people who were really in touch with true reality and everybody else was you know in a kind of second-rate intellectual discipline and they still insist on this kind of privilege right. so when somebody like Kuhn or Bruno Latour comes along and says hey science isn't all that different from all the rest of inquiry they get outraged but again I you know I don't think it's much to worry about extremely radical postmodern leftist thinkers who are hell-bent on demolishing the fundamental substructure of Western civilization. And that's no, that's no paranoid delusion. But again, I, you know, I don't think it's much to worry about. The biggest thing for me about, that was interesting about postmodernism is that it was the first text that was highly self-conscious. Self-conscious of itself as text, self-conscious of the writer as persona, um, self-conscious about um, the effects that narrative had on readers and the fact that the readers probably knew that. It was, it was the first generation of writers who'd actually read a lot of criticism. Like I've read a fair bit of Foucault, less of Derrida, but enough to get a pretty good sense of what he's on about. Yeah. And, and there was a certain schizophrenia about it. It was very useful, it seems to me, because the culture, this, this was a real beaker of acid in the face of the culture. The culture at the time this came out, this was before, you know, the youth rebellion in the 60s, was very staid and very conservative and very mm. Alfred Kazanish. Um, and the, the, the problem, though, is now is that a lot of the shticks of postmodernism, irony, cynicism, irreverence, are now part of whatever it is that's enervating in the culture itself, right? Burger King now sells hamburgers with you got to break the rules. Mm. Right. Um, so I'm, I don't really consider myself a postmodernist. I don't consider myself much of anything. But I do know that that's the, tra the tradition that excited me when I started to write. The postmodernists rejected the idea that there was universal truth. And everything to the postmodernists is about power. Critical theory is that epistemology that is used, and I can explain that, I, it's complicated. I'm afraid yeah, yeah. we're going to lose we're, people we're, no, because right. we got a lot of terms we got to throw out. It's yeah. very complicated. But what I would like to attempt to do in this segment is to link the madness on campuses right now to the intellectual engines driving that madness. Mm -hmm. And and the, make no mistake about it, these departments tainted by postmodernism are absolutely filled with zealots and morally motivated ide ideologues. And bring to the people of New York State the kind of compassion and feeling that is all over this country. I'm honored to be here with you today. Now let's kick some, all right? So let's. So I'll do a little catch up, so that in case anyone's missing any of this. So first, let's let's talk about what is postmodernism. I know I know most Americans okay. knows that, but let's just let's just do a couple definitions quick. So okay. Can, so let's do yeah. the definition. So okay. So the Frankfurt Frankfurt School has this idea of. Well, let, let's even go back for it. Let's go back to Karl Marx. Karl Marx was a philosopher. Oh, here's a bonus question. Why did Hitler hate Karl Marx? I feel like there's a good punchline. He, well, it's not a joke, it's actually a because he's oh. a Jew. Oh. Anything the Jews touched were... <laughs> oh, okay. Well, here, we could lay it out quickly. Okay. You know, because I've been, I've been thinking about how to communicate this properly. And so, 
the thing about the postmodernists, and I'm going to speak mostly about Jacques Derrida, because I'll consider him the central villain. Now, he actually, he, he may, they make a point. Parce que l'expérience, alors ce que je veux dire par américain, ici, évidemment l'usage du mot américain est peut-être un peu abusif, bien sûr. Euh, ce que j'appelle américain ici, c'est deux choses. L'une qui est un peu abusive, l'autre qui l'est moins. Ce qui est un peu abusif, c'est l'attitude la, 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 euh, utilitaire, manipulatrice. Voilà, euh, on a besoin de ça, do it. Euh, alors, euh, euh, sur tel terme, allez-y. Action. Alors évidemment, tous ceux qui font du cinéma font ça. Mais le cinéma, c'est américain, vous savez. Le cinéma est plus américain qu'autre chose. That vision, for example, turns out to be way, way, way more complicated than anybody ever ever estimated. In fact, you can't actually solve the vision problem until you solve the embodiment problem. So, uh, an artificial intelligence that doesn't have a body can't really see because seeing is actually the mapping of the world onto action. And so that was figured out more, more or less by a robotics engineer called Rodney Brooks. But Merleau-Ponty has an analysis of perception as a embodied activity in which we move to get an optimal grip on things, which makes it more of the ready to hand, thereby completing the Heidegger picture. Or if you're trying to build a mind, as people using computers and artificial intelligence are doing, Husserl is also the father of artificial intelligence. Many of his ideas that the mind follows hierarchies of strict rules are now being cashed out into computer programs. So Husserl's doing fine. Heidegger's doing fine, too. Early Heidegger, being in time, is not perhaps as, in, as much followed now as it should be. I'm using it the way I use it is as I've been using it here. If you if you actually get back to the phenomena of our engaged everyday activity, you can criticize the linguistic analysts who either trust their intuitions or trust our linguistic categories. Heidegger would say, and I think a description of skills shows it, that if you trust our intuitions, you talk always about beliefs, desires, and so forth, and that that's not an adequate description of what's normally going on. It's only a breakdown description. And likewise, we talked about how our language mirrors not the everyday coping, but the breakdown. So there, Heidegger phenomenology it gives us a, a good point for criticizing some un, unquestioned assumptions of contemporary Anglo-American philosophy. Mm -hmm. And finally, in Europe now, particularly in France, later Heidegger is the uh, great father of those who want to, as he already put it, deconstruct the tradition. For instance, Michel Foucault and Jacques Derrida are trying to follow out the Heidegger project of defining exactly what our understanding of being is in order to help us get over it. So I would say that there is hardly any area of intellectual activity these days in which the concerns of these thinkers don't play a large role. I'm trying to think of a way so that this will have anything to do with what we've talked about before. Imagine you're a hyper-educated avant-gardist in grad school learning to write. Right. Okay. Um, screen gets all fuzzy now as the viewers invited to imagine this. Um, coming out of an avant-garde tradition, I get to this grad school, and the grad school turns out all the teachers are realists. They're not at all interested in post postmodern avant-garde stuff. Poses a larger threat to the integrity of our culture than than I've currently stated. It's more widespread than I thought. So here. We'll end by returning to this, this quote. For us today, I think we can look to Derrida's words not as some sort of orthodoxy or der of Derridian deconstruction, I think that would be a mistake, but to imagine the ways that social, cultural, and critical theory in all of their variants can be powerful intellectual engines of complex critical engagement. Now I can't tell you that this is an engine for good, or for progress, or even for action, this would be hypocritical to do so because, of course, part of what is at stake is trying to figure out what it means when we decide something is good or something uh, is progressive, or even what it means when we take action. But it can serve to question and reimagine, and I do think we undervalue imagination these days, to reimagine the grounds upon which we make such choices about things like the good, about progress about action. 
One of the fascinating and maddening aspects of deconstruction as critique is that it does not end, and some of you are thinking like this lecture. However, to give but one example, justice for Derrida is never to be achieved, and, and I don't believe that that means that it's something we shouldn't aspire to or try to, that to do, that we should throw up our hands. I think for Derrida, this means it's something towards which we must always work. Justice is never done. On the day it's done, we're not striving toward justice in anymore, and therefore we're acting unjustly. It's something toward which we must always work, and we must always work critically. Likewise, social, cultural, and critical theory never ends because there is always more work to be done. And I'll end with this last quote from Derrida's last lecture in regard to social, critical, cultural, and critical theory. I would say today that responsibility is critical. Thank you very much. Well, and ingratitude and arrogance. I mean, the, the list goes on and on. So I don't feel that I've misrepresented the postmodernists in the least. And I, find, I regard, like I've read a fair bit of Foucault, less of Derrida, but enough to get a pretty good sense of what he's on about.